yeah um i have a book coming <laughs> so um i i don't think i'll share too much about that right now because everything i'm going to share throughout my whole presentation is what i've actually shared in my book um, and that's coming in july so in a couple of weeks so i will just start off by introducing myself the way i always do um, good morning, uh, friends, family, elders, uh, leadership. My name is Tithkanit and I'm from the Okanagan and Shuswap Nations. Uh, my name Tithkanit means standing by water. It was given to me on the day I was born by my Tama, Eileen Alec. My late father is Saul Kenzie Basil from the Bonaparte Indian Band. Um, he was chief there for a few years back in the 70s. Uh, he is the son of Saul and Louisa Basil. He was also a part of the American Indian Movement and uh, Red Power Movement back in the 70s and was partially responsible for the shutdown of the Department of Indian Affairs offices back in 1974. My late mother is Sophie Alec from the Penticton Indian Band. She is the daughter of the late Chief Jack Alec, who was chief for 24 years um, before he passed away. And Eileen Alec, who is also known as Philemon Francois, who was the daughter of Chief Francois, who is also known as Surimt, who is the son of Kuthbuk Jainton. We are descendants of Pelkamula, who comes from um, northern Washington and he was one of our great hereditary chiefs. He was alive back in the early 1600s and had 24 wives from different nations from Washington into British Columbia. So I always introduce myself that way. One, because my elders told me to, to uh, so that people know who I am and know what land I'm connected to. Um, I'm also told to introduce myself that way uh, because there was a time when my, my mother and grandmother couldn't speak their language and so every time I speak my language I honor my mother and grandmother and my father who all attended residential school. And I also introduce myself that way because I was told that when I name my ancestors out loud that they will come to stand with me, especially when I talk about things that might be really hard to talk about. So I always start off by sharing a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Elaine Alec and I grew up on the Penticton Indian Band Reserve most of my life. I spent the first six years with my Tama, my grandmother, who spoke nothing but the language. And she used to wake us up really early in the morning to go out to the, to the creek or the creek and up into the hills behind where uh, she lived and she would tell us to do things at the water and she would tell us to do things on the land and she would tell us to introduce ourselves to the land so that uh, we would never have to be scared about uh, the animals that were out there, that the animals were our parents, the animals were our spirit helpers, that as long as we introduced ourselves in a respectful way, um, we, would, we would be okay. And uh, I didn't know that I was really lucky at the time until I was in my 30s, how lucky and how blessed I really was to be able to grow up with those teachings. Uh, I spent a majority of my life with my Tama because my mother was a practicing alcoholic until I was 10 years old and my dad had left um, when I was still really young. And so um, growing up with an alcoholic mother and looking at my community at the time, a majority, if not 98% of the homes on our reserve were um, filled with alcohol and uh, drugs. And so there weren't very many safe spaces in, in our community at the time. And uh, we witnessed a lot of abuse and it was completely normalized. So I was sexually abused from the age of four to 10 and not just by one community member, but by many community members. And it was something that we all knew was happening, but we didn't talk about it. I started smoking at the age of 10 and I started drinking at the age of 12 and running away and jumping on the highway and, and hitchhiking from Penticton to Prince George and um, through Kamloops. And uh, I, I didn't fear for my safety back then. I was just trying to get away. 
and I didn't understand that I was trying to run away from something or what was happening to me or the things that had happened to me when I was young. And I share this story um, even when we talk about planning, even when I'm sitting at the table with leadership because it's important for us to know that a majority of our community members have this story. I, I've spoken to groups um, throughout Canada over the last 20 years and every time I share that story people come up to me afterwards and say that I shared their story um, and so it's really important to know that this is something that a majority of our community members are dealing with. Um, I truly believe that I have been able to get through life and uh, come into the work that I do because I was raised by my grandmother. Um, I dropped out of school when I was in grade nine. Um, my first day of school when I was five years old, I was tripped by a little girl with perfect blonde curls and, and pretty blue eyes and she called me a dirty squaw and I never knew what that word meant. And from then on for the rest of my elementary school years, uh, I was bullied, um, I was pushed uh, and Kids would whisper things in my ear uh, and that started at five by other five-year-old kids and I heard the term wagon burner and I remember going home and asking my uncles what that meant because uh, people were calling me those names um, and that's another reality that the racism that exists that we've had to work through and um, hearing those things my entire life I truly believed um, right until I was in my early 30s that I was ugly and dirty and that I wasn't smart enough and that I was stupid because I didn't understand math or because I didn't fit into school and what what really helped me get through that was remembering who I was and where I came from and those stories that my grandmother taught me because what I began to learn was that those stories the language um, knowing about the land, those things were our governing laws. Those things taught us how to behave as an individual. Those things taught us how to behave within our families. Those stories and the language told us how we were to be a part of the community. And those stories told us and they gave us the laws that we needed to know how and how to take care of the land and how to govern. And it taught us how to be good human beings. And, you know, a lot of the stuff that's happening today, especially with talk about defunding RCMP and how that would create chaos. And, you know, I've been wanting to write about that because our people, we never had RCMP. We never had police. They were put in place to arrest our people for not sending their kids to residential schools. And so, you know, I think about that and I think about indigenous ways of knowing and being and governing and how right from birth we were told um, how important we were and that we were here for a purpose and that we had spirit helpers that checked on us because the creator loved us so much. And can you imagine instead of growing up with those um, fear-based ways of being, of, of attacking and of, of, of hurting each other and of talking about differences, if we instead learn those stories of love, of that you are loved, that you have purpose, that you are valuable, even if we don't agree that you still have place in our community and you're, you're going to contribute to that, how that would impact you as an individual. Our stories told us the difference between right and wrong, and our stories told us about if we do wrong things that there are gonna be consequences. And so those were ingrained, they were deeply ingrained into us. Every day they were repetitive, our people are storytellers, we didn't write things down. And so, you know, when we tell those stories over and over and over again, they become a part of who we are. You know, they, they become a way of us to, you know, um, be, behave with each other. So we didn't have RCMP because we knew how to monitor ourselves and how to behave within our communities. So the diagram that I have up is my community plan from my community and I have taken it and I utilize it in everything that I do. I utilize it in how I make decisions for myself. I utilize it when I'm, I'm considering about, um, when I'm having a hard time and I, I need to heal. And when I'm having conflict in my life, I look at this diagram and I think about how it affects me and, and what I need to do. Um, I use this when I think about how I need to do business and, and when I need to make business decisions for myself and for our company. 
And I look at this and I utilize this diagram in all of my planning. And every time I need to make a decision, this is how, this is what I use. And so it is based on the nested system. Most indigenous communities uh, throughout North America, if not the world, live in a nested community and uh, nested system. And we're all systems thinkers. Um, where the in, for us in the seal territory, the individual is at the center, the family is outside of that, the community is outside of that, and the Timuhulah or land is outside of that. And for us, Timuhulah means more than just land. It means uh, the stars, it means the universe, it means the water, it means the trees, it means every living thing that's in this world. And so um, it also has something in there that talks about uh, concrete knowledge of things that you can see and can't see and so we understand that there are spirits out there that are a part of our world that we know are there even if we can't see them it's that faith that's embedded into our language and so other communities um, might have the child at the center uh, surrounded by the elders surrounded by the women surrounded by the men and I include that because I once heard a story in my in my late twenties um, from a Cree woman in southern Alberta about this nested system and how that's how our community was really solid. How we were able to go to war and we always remained intact. Or if people attacked us, we would always remain intact. And she talked about prophecy, about how um, one day somebody was going to come and that after they came we were going to have a hundred years of darkness and it was the people that figured out how to tear our families apart and they knew that by taking the child away from the center our purpose our values everything would would fall apart and that's what happened through residential schools that's what's happening through the child welfare system right now they're removing our children from our communities and we are totally losing our our purpose um, within that. <coughs> so um, I'm also going to share a story uh, because this story is our creation story and it tells us um, how to govern ourselves and how to make decisions and how to be. It's one of those stories that, you know, you hear as a bedtime story. I heard it from my Tama every night she would tell the story and I'd always fall asleep. And as I got older, she would tell me more about the story and the story got really long. And it's a very long story with so many different teachings that adapt um, depending on the ch child's age. And so it really becomes a way of being in, in a way that contributes to making your decisions. So this story is called the Four Food Chief Story. And before people were here, there were only animal people who roamed the earth. And there were four uh, chiefs. There was Chief Black Bear. He was chief of all things that uh, walked on the land and flew in the air. Chief Spring Salmon was the chief of all things that lived in the water. Chief Saskatoon Berry was the chief of all things that grew above ground, and Chief Bitterroot was the chief of all things that grew below ground. And one day the creator came and he said, there's going to be a being that comes and you have to figure out how to keep this being alive. And so the creator left the being between the four chiefs and left. And the chiefs looked at the being and they said, this is the most pitiful excuse for a being we've ever seen. It's born with no fur, no claws to protect itself, How nothing in its head. How are we supposed to keep this being alive? And so the chiefs talked for a really long time and um, they finally looked at Chief Black Bear who, and they said, well, you're the oldest, you tell us what to do. So that's one of our very first teachings that when we need to make an important decision, we need to look to our elders and include them in that. So Chief Black Bear sat there and he thought about it for a very long time and he said, I'm going to lay my life down for this being and everything that I am, it can have. It can have my meat, it can have my fur, it can have my claws, it can have whatever it needs to keep itself alive. So all of the other animal, uh, all of the other food chiefs said the same thing. So Chief Black Bear said, I'm going to lay my life down now and you have to sing me back to life. And so Chief Black Bear laid his life down and the the other chiefs came to sing their song and Chief Black Bear didn't come back to life. 
So all of the other animal people came, uh, muskrat and coyote, they all came to sing their song and still Chief Black Bear didn't come back to life. Finally, the last being came. Let me sing my song, I wanna sing my song. And everybody kept shooing him away. Go on, get out of here. Nobody wants to hear your song. All you do is eat crap and bug people. No one wants to hear your song. And it was um, Fly. And Fly managed to come in anyways and landed on Chief Black Bear's ear and sang his song. And Chief Black Bear came back to life. And what that story tells us is that um, even the most small and insignificant being, the one that's the bug, the one that nobody wants around, even his voice and song was just as powerful as the chief song and voice. And that when we take the time to hear from everybody that we are so powerful that we can bring back life. And it talks about the importance of valuing everybody in our community, even the ones that are the Hellraiser, the bug fly represents our people who are incarcerated, our ones lost in addictions, our ones that uh, are that walk into the meeting and the naysayers, the ones who we don't want to listen to. We were told that they are just as important and they are our teacher and that fly shows up in our life in very different ways and that they are the teacher that we have to listen to, especially when we don't want to, to be able to um, help us learn discipline of being able to be present and listening to what they have to say instead of um, listening from your judgment. And so I think that's a very important teaching and, and a story that I think needs to be shared with every child and every, you know, every person that's growing up. I'd love to see the story incorporated into the school system, something that our kids heard every day all the time. Imagine um, the type of values they would have by, by understanding that. So Chief Black Bear represents the traditional thinker. Um, our stories and our decision-making models understood that there were four different perspectives in our community and that we had to include those perspectives. And so Chief Black Bear uh, represented the traditional thinkers, the ones who like structure, the ones who like rules, the ones who are the storytellers, the ones who remember the way it's always been done. Uh, Chief Saskatoon Berry represents the innovative thinkers, the ones who think outside the box, the ones who think really big that people think they're crazy. <coughs> um, those are polar opposites and they often have conflict in our community. Chief Spring Salmon represents our action people. They are the ones who just want to get it done. They're tired of talking about it. They don't like the fluff. They don't like emotion. They just want to get going with it and, and they often leave people behind. Um, Chief Bitteru is the relationship perspective. They don't want to leave anybody behind. They want to remember everybody and to include them and to make sure that everybody's voice is heard. And those are polar opposites in our community. But what our process, our Indigenous processes teach us, which are mostly matriarchal and egalitarian teachings, is that we need all of those voices. Often you see working groups where people, you know, only want to work with their like-minded people because they don't want anybody slowing them down. But then you see that it's kind of the same, we keep planning about the same things over and over and over again, using these systems that don't work for us. Those are very patriarchal systems that we're utilizing. And so when I hear the word indigenize, I don't like that because it means you're trying to take a colonial or patriarchal process and paint it red and call it Indian by throwing in an opening prayer or having some kind of ceremony as part of the agenda. Um, instead of utilizing an indigenous planning process or a ceremony, and that's how you utilize, you know, that's how you are together. It's how you're going to be together. It's the protocols that you put in place. Um, no Roberts rules, no, you know, outvoting each other. It's finding a way to bring different perspectives together to create one whole picture and including the people that you don't like. Even if you don't like them, there's protocols in place that we will do our best to be disciplined to hear people without judging if what they're saying is right or wrong or good or bad and understanding that everybody has purpose and everybody has value because we can't create a plan and we can't bring it to life without that and that takes a lot of healing work and i say that every successful plan 
that's out there, especially for Indigenous communities and for all communities, is when you take the time to make healing the foundation of your plan. And so many action people don't want to do that. They don't see the, the, the why we have to and they'll push it forward. But then realizing they're going to have to go backwards because they didn't do all of that work. And then they waste $120,000 because they left a whole part of all those other perspectives out. And I see that a lot, especially with land use planning and economic development planning, where you need to pay money to do a designation and you need to do voting. And, you know, all of these action people are trying to push it forward, but then it goes back to community and they vote against it. And then, so for me, you know, including all of those voices and doing the fluffy stuff that you don't want to do, that's an investment of time so that you're not spending this money trying to exclude other people. And that's those patriarchal and colonial systems find ways to exclude people throughout the process. So um, when I, I talk about this, this is the whole, this is what decolonizing and using a decolonized approach is. This is what it means to use an indigenized approach. You use these stories and these foundations and you utilize it through the whole thing, even if it doesn't look like what we're used to, you know, where we're having the agendas and the topics and, and guiding people and vetting questions because we want something, we, we have an idea of what we want it to look like. Um, so we kind of guide it. Whereas, and it's very controlled and controlling is fear-based. Whereas this process is faith-based. It's love, it's trust, it's believing that the people will give us the answer that we need so that we can move forward together. And a lot of times we have way too many trust issues um, that we need to work on, on within ourselves in order to move forward. And so that's why looking at that nested system is really important. We look at our organizations. I've worked within both provincial and federal governments. It's like working for a big blown up band office. Um, you know, we're constantly working three to five different jobs and roles and uh, we're working 12 to 18 hour days and we're trying to make and fix things for our community, our family, our land, but nothing's changing. And it's because we forgotten the very center of our system, which is the individual. And so in order for us to do good work, in order for us to support healing, in order for us to support indigenous ways of being and knowing, we have to do the work ourselves and have that self um, and know, you know, ourselves so that we can sit in a circle and listen and trust and have faith in the people that we're working with. If we don't have that, we're, if we're not trusting and if we're not providing that space, we're not a safe space. And so we can't create a safe space for others. And that's really important because too often we try to force things and we go in with our surveys and our you know, trying to figure out how to do this planning and we're not giving people enough information, we're not spending time on educating, we're not spending time on asking people what's on their heart and we push it forward and then we try to do an implementation plan because, oh, the reason why these plans aren't working is because we don't have a good implementation plan. But the reality is if you do it properly, you don't need an implementation plan because if you do it properly, you will see yourself as you go through the process and you will be a part of it and you know you will know your role and you will know your purpose and how you move forward in this because these indigenous um, practices means that we ask people to show up authentically as themselves and to think as they would think themselves without worrying or trying to fit in somebody else's box because an innovative thinker isn't going to think like a traditional thinker an action thinker isn't going to think like a relationship thinker and they're all going to communicate differently they're all going to use different languages and all of those things are important to bring together to make that plan come to life i've done economic development plans i've done mmiwg um oh i've um i've done land use plans and ccps and health plans and if you take the label off of them, they all will say the same thing. They all want to, you know, they all want to talk about the same thing. They want to talk about the healing. They want to talk about um, 
they want to talk about lateral violence they want to talk about their social issues it doesn't matter what it is that you're talking about um, all of the if you do a community driven plan they're all going to turn out the same so um, I think that's that's about it I I'm a storyteller so I don't do notes and I don't write anything out I utilize this um, diagram and whatever comes out comes out but a lot of what I've shared and uh, I go into detail about that in my book um, my book is called calling my spirit back and it's going to be coming out in July um, I have some information about it on my website that's in my bio, uh, my bio that was included in the notes here and this diagram will also be shared as well um, some of the other work that I did with MMIWG was called the Path Forward work. Um, we have a website called pathforward.ca and it has our plan on there and it also talks about our process in that plan. And so there's also a toolkit with that Path Forward plan. And like I said, it doesn't matter what you're planning for, these um, tools and these teachings can be utilized in whatever it is that you're doing.